Welcome to Plymouth Church United Church of Christ. Thank you for being with us today. I'm the Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown, and on behalf of our clergy team and staff, we welcome you. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are indeed welcomed here. In fact, we are happy that you decided to be with us today precisely because of how you arrive and who you are and how you identify and who you love and how you are abled. You found in Plymouth Church a progressive Christian fellowship doing its best to be a place of radical inclusivity, faith, and love. So let us know more about you in the comment section below or send us an email by clicking on the logo above. Comment, like, subscribe, and share this link with others. In this time of pandemic and physical distancing, we continue to gather by the Spirit while standing in faith and hope, together as a transforming and authentic congregation who traditionally meets in the heart of downtown Seattle, but now meets in our homes. We are operating with the understanding that we may not be together in the traditional sense until 2021. And when we return with God as our helper, we want to come back together without anyone missing. We invite you to visit our website, PlymouthChurchSeattle.org and help us to be the church of Jesus Christ by supporting financially this ministry. Use the green give box to share your secure online gift or text your gift to 206-208-1442. If you wish, you may download the Worship Bulletin PDF on our website so that you might follow along. And on this holiday weekend, we honor and celebrate the labor of workers whose innovations and creativity and time and energy have benefited and built this nation, especially the laborers upon whom we still rely who struggle for recognition, equity, and reparations. Today, we are also very excited to feature the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, Senior Pastor of the Great Trinity UCC Church in Chicago, Illinois, and to feature his sermon called The Cross and the Lynching Tree, The Requiem of Ahmad Arbery. Today, we will also feature a song written by Seattle composer Eric Banks, his song called To Be a Stranger. We pray this worship enlivens you and inspires you and causes you to transform. We pray that you feel called to the deeper meaning coming alive in you. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Peace be with you, Plymouth. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.
Eduardo Munoz. Henry Wayne Rivera. Sterling Higgins. Javier Ambler. Pamela Turner. Dominique Clayton. Ryan Twyman. Leilene Polanco. Li Xi Wang. Joseph Richardson. Elijah McLean. Melvin Watkins. Tatiana Jefferson. Christopher Whitfield. Michael Lorenzo Dean. Plondo Anatok. William Howard Green. Ahmad Arbery. Manuel Ellis. Barry Gettius. Rihanna Taylor. Donnie Sanders. Michael Ramos. Drejan Reed. Maurice Gordon. George Floyd. Tony McDade. David McAtee. Sean Monterosa. Jamel Floyd. Carlos Carson. Andres Cuadrado Pineda. Identity, Identity is not in head. It is not in head. It is not in head. It is not in head. That does not Oh, my God. 
5,000 steps, 2.2 miles. A man just shy of his 26th birthday stepped out into the sun and ran for the final time upon this earth. 5,000 steps, 2.2 miles. He encountered two men who tested positive for Confederate COVID-1619. The disease is often asymptomatic and spreads through human contact, rhetoric, ignorance, and family relationship. Ahmad Arbery, a man of potential, was attacked and killed by men infected with America's most common and potent viral agent. This virus alters the eyesight of the attacker weaponizing the body, giving the illusion of blackness as a threat, making melanin appear as a weapon and any movement as potential danger. It took 10 weeks for an arrest to be made due to the potency of this viral agent. It was necessary for a videotape to be released and pressure from prophetic voices to force the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to relieve the local Brunswick, Georgia police of their duty in this matter. Another life taken, another public lynching, another news story, another act of recorded black death. It is disturbing our nation has become comfortable with weekly broadcasts of black bodies falling to the ground. It has become an unsolicited primetime series that we all hope and pray will be canceled from the collective consciousness of America's civic memory. 5,000 steps. 2.2 miles. The death of Ahmaud Arbery is not an anomaly, but a historical pattern of behavior that binds every American to an unexamined history of our nation. I am Otis Moss III, and this is the cross and the lynching tree, a requiem for Ahmaud Arbery. Many will hear my voice and shy away from this story of lament. But I believe freedom resides within our reach when we face our fears and come to grips with the truth. The death of Ahmad and other bright stars kissed by nature's sun who were robbed of the opportunity to shine in the light of this unfinished democracy is rooted in a history we failed to acknowledge. This American project, this experiment of bruised democracy was born in the murky depths of predatory self-interest, nursed by a parent known as chattel slavery. This demonic agent has hovered around human society for centuries, but this form of enslavement brought to the alleged new world, attached a nuance not seen in human history. Chattel slavery introduced the myth of race and racial hierarchy. It was a new flavor added to this ancient form of cruelty. This new invention of racial caste would forever color the landscape of America's past and yet to be. America's wealth was birthed out of this new system for this country's economic growth depended on the scarred yet strong hands of black people, black men, black women, and children without permission gave their genius, intellectual creativity, and spiritual vitality to enrich colonial territories and eventual southern states in America. Many cannot admit it, nor embrace the fact that America is America because of black labor and black genius. The wealth of Wall Street was cultivated from the soil of an illicit trade and branded backs of a stolen people. This myth of race is a socially constructed lie where people in power defined another group with arbitrary characteristics. We ceased in America to be African, Igbo, Yoruba, Fulani, Ashanti. We became a caste, not an ethnicity but a thing in the imagination of a people who feared our potential and were terrified of our power. Our color was weaponized. Blackness carried a strange duality. Is it not strange, the insanity of racism and supremacist thought? We were brilliant enough to feed white children. 
nurse them at our breast, rotate crops, plant and engineer new agricultural species, design and build homes and bridges. We could train horses, domesticate wild animals, introduce new cooking techniques to America and expose the world to new musical genres, delight the nation with our oral dexterity to tell a story. We could recite verses from memory, create poetry on the spot, and yet the myth stated we were still not intelligent and physically dangerous due to our beautifully melanated skin, even though the entire economic system of America rested on our ingenuity. It should be noted, even though this lie was being communicated, we by nature were and are a people of resistance. Our faith was and is a faith of resistance. The Christianity practiced by people of African descent led to revolts, radical resistance, and a new interpretation of what it meant to follow Jesus. We saw Jesus not as a European figure given to us by missionaries, but as a dark-skinned Palestinian Jew who stood on the side of the oppressed. Jesus was for us and with us, was a savior who experienced the pain of occupation and knew the heartache of loved ones being brutalized by occupying forces. Jesus was not just a spiritual figure, but a physical savior who knew all about our troubles. The disease of racial terror spread, but the vaccine of our spirituality demanded we fight. Never forget we are a people of the Spirit, and as people of the Spirit, we recognize something, that when we pray, we also protest. Our ring shouts are connected to resistance, songs are connected to service. We have the ability to speak in tongues and speak truth to power all at the same time. Our tradition has never been either or, but always both and, merging the sacred and the secular. Our ancestors believed all life is sacred, all action is sacred. When you cook in the kitchen, it's sacred and can cause a shout. When you sing, it is sacred and can cause you to dance. Loving is sacred and is ordained by God. Even jogging to maintain your temple was a sacred act. Nothing was removed from the realm of God. We are people of resistance. From the moment we placed our feet upon this foreign soil, we resisted. We held fast to a spirituality and to the spirit that sang in our hearts, before I be a slave, I will be buried in my grave. Our faith is a faith of resistance. Our journey has been a journey of resistance, not acceptance, not compromise, but resistance. We found ways to make a way out of no way to open doors no man can shut and shut doors that no man can reopen. We claimed our agency when our humanity was questioned by questionable people. We tied a knot at the end of our rope just so that we could hang on a little while longer. Do not fall for the false or foolish quasi-academic tales that our faith caused us to accept oppression. Our faith was never made, made us docile. This is a lie. There was a reason reading the Bible was illegal. There was a reason reciting the gospel was outlawed. There was a reason a man or a woman could not preach without a white person present. Those who tried to hold our souls hostage knew reading leads to resistance and reading the words of Jesus and the actions of Moses will lead to underground railroads, abolition, and in some cases, plantations will end up being burned down. We are people of resistance, and our resistance always, unfortunately, led to resentment. After emancipation, four million people of African descent were freed into the imperfect union of the United States. The period of reconstruction and resentment led to people of African descent being elected to Congress, the Senate, and state houses across the United States. From 1865 to 1877, the South witnessed an unprecedented level of governmental efficiency and compassion for all citizens. Congressman Thomas Miller, one of the first people of African ancestry to sit in the House of Representatives, stated this about his native South Carolina. We have built schoolhouses, 
established charitable institutions, built and maintained the penitentiary system, provided education for the deaf, rebuilt ferries and bridges. In short, we reconstructed the state, placed it upon the road of prosperity. Black people, the ones disinherited, place the South in the position to prosper 200 years or after dehumanization. We gave the South prosperity, not punitive action. And in return, our former Confederate brethren gave us ashes for our beauty. This act of agency and excellence caused deep resentment as black people, skilled and unskilled, competed with white labor. Men who were fed the lie of racial superiority could not face the truth that black people were not inferior. Southern life from 1865 to 1877 had improved not just the lives of black people, but for all people who resided in the South. For a person in power to reject the lie of racial superiority was to give up the true religion of America, capitalism plus racial privilege. In order to protect the economic interests of landowners and the fragile egos of men who bought into this racial lie, a new myth was born, the myth of black criminality. One professional charlatan by the name of D.W. Griffith used his filmmaking technique to tell the world that those of a darker hue are prone to crime and have an irresistible urge to assault women. They can only be tamed through rough and brutal means to keep them in their place. Stay in your place, boy. Stay in your place, girl. Stay in your place. We cannot allow you to roam free in this country. You are not a real citizen, and you have no rights that I am bound to respect. As a matter of fact, I need to check your ID. When you are in spaces, I determine you should not be. Give me your ID. What are you doing in this neighborhood? Why do you have those Skittles in your hand? What are you doing with that bottle of tea? You look suspicious in that hoodie. How dare you run through my neighborhood? Let me see your long form birth certificate to ensure that you are an American citizen. How dare you, boy? assault my fragile ego by forcing this nation to face the fact that racism is a lie. We are here to make America great again. There are those who would rather believe the lie, thinking it is better to damn a nation and curse our children than face the fact that all of humanity has been created equal in the sight of God. 5,000 steps, two point two miles. It is the poet of the Psalms who raises the question, and it is the word uh, to those of us uh, who are fearful for our children on this day and want to see a better nation rise. It is a word that we must all shout together collectively as citizens of this country if it is to be the country that God intends it to be. We must wrestle with the question, how long must I wrestle with these thoughts? As the psalmist says, how long must I rest uh, in this sorrow and must it speak from my soul? The question from the poet is the question every black parent who raises a child must raise within their soul. What Confederate virus shall attack my child this day? Will their childlike bodies become mutated in the eyes of men holding guns? Shall they be broken by micro slights that see their brilliance as an exception and their acceptance into college as a scheme? Should they be bruised or will they be bruised by kinfolk looking to release their pain in the form of violence upon bodies that mirror their own? Shall my daughter as a, be seen as a grown woman because in the mind of some men, her skin always adds 10 years to the age of a little black girl. These are the questions no parent should wrestle with, but all parents raising a black child must confront the slippery demon of anxiety lurks in the back of our mind. Will they make it home today? We find 
some comfort in the psalmist, for the psalmist understood our current pain through the past experience of those who were called Israelites. Being a Hebrew, a Jew, an Israelite, a person of the darker hue, under occupation, you were allowed uh, to raise questions to God in poetry and song about your sanity and also about the safety of your family. The psalmist is under occupation, living in a world where a nation viewed his people as worthless and minimal at best. The writer wants God to answer, and in the process does a revolutionary thing. I dare us to do as a nation what the psalmist has done uh, and change the trajectory of this country. The psalmist was willing to face uh, the tragedy with a faith that was uh, so uplifting and powerful, a faith that faces tragedy. If we are to change the course of our civic river, we must call the names of those uh, we lost and face the tragedy of this moment. Do not hide your head, but call the name of Ahmad and the names of all those who died because the reflection of their skin caused a man of power to become blind. Call the names of those who rest in power. Call the names of daughters and sons. We are unashamed to call the name of Ahmad. Say the names of those lost too early and swept away by tragedy. Say their names. Say their names. Speak their names. Say their names. And in saying their names, we develop a faith that is able to bless while we are yet bleeding. The psalmist in the 22nd division offers another lament and it speaks to our moment. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The psalmist uh, did something difficult, raising a difficult question uh, before God. But this is the same question that is picked up by Jesus on Calvary. Jesus offers this lament, speaking to God, asking God while he is on the cross, God, why have you forsaken me? But there's something that I love about Jesus, because as he is bleeding on the cross, he is still offering forgiveness and at the same time welcoming people into the kingdom of God. Jesus was blessing while he was bleeding. Our hearts break. Our souls are bloody from the strain of this moment because we have seen too many of these moments. We are not simply called to bleed and act as victims. We must also bless and work and seek justice. We are called to live a life of love and compassion and courage. This nation shall not be saved by those in power, nor saved by those who seek power, but by those who have tender hearts and tough souls, those who have been outcast and desire a better tomorrow. America can only be saved by those who have the dexterity to bless while they are still bleeding. Bless, I say. We bleed, but we must bless. We weep for our children, but we must bless at the same time for those who have not yet been born. And you raise the question, how do we bless? We must pray, and then after our prayers, get up and vote. How do we bless? We pray, and after our prayers, get up and dare create a moral economy. How do we bless? We pray, then we get up and repeal every stand your ground and open and carry law. How do we bless? We pray, and then raise money to elect DAs, sheriffs, and judges. We have work to do. A faith that carries the scars of liberation and the scars of the cross. The cross, according to James Cone, is the ancient symbol of lynching. Our Savior was lynched. Hmm. Uh, we must reinterpret our faith so that it is returned back to the source. Faith in Christ means we are to forever advocate for the disinherited. We have removed all the radicalism from our faith. We have been hypnotized by an Americanized form of capitalism that masquerades as Christianity. Our faith carries the scars of Calvary. Our faith walk is not about avoiding pain and self-help, but being transformed and becoming the hands and feet of Christ. The cross was a lynching event. And if we identify the cross as a moment of lynching, we deepen our compassion and our call for the most vulnerable in our society. The psalmist asked the question, 
that we must ask today, how long? And I borrow from the words of that great prophet by the name of Martin Luther King Jr. How long? Not long. Because Carlisle is right, no lie can live forever. How long? Not long. Because William Cullen Bryant is right, truth crushed to the ground will arise again. How long? Not long. Because James Russell Lowell is right, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, yet the scaffold sways the future. How long? Not long. Because the Bible is right, you shall reap what you sow. With this faith, we will be able to hew out the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of humanity. With this faith, we will be able to speed up the day when all of God's children in our nation, whether black or white, Muslim or Methodist, Asian or Atheist, Latino or Lutheran, Presbyterian or Pentecostal, Protestant or Catholic, Jew or Gentile, queer or Quaker, agnostic or Anglican, Baptist or Buddhist, Hindu or holiness, ghetto or country, Sikh or sanctified, redneck or reformed, urban or suburban, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of that great poet from South Central LA named Kendrick Lamar, we gonna be all right or in the words of our ancestors free at last free at last thank god almighty we are free at last Thank you for being a part of the beloved community that is Plymouth Church, United Church of Christ. And thank you for being with us and praying for us and supporting this transforming ministry with your presence, your gifts, and your resources. We are the church, dear friends, whether in the building or in our homes. May you feel held and known and loved. And thank you again for being with us. Please join us for the coffee hour with the link provided on the front page of our website, PlymouthChurchSeattle.org. Email us at info at PlymouthChurchSeattle.org for the passcode if you don't already have it. God bless you all and go in peace. Thank you.